Hello, my name is Rick Bradford, better known to some people by my pen name of William Collins, author of the book The Empathy Gap. I'm a trustee of the charity Families Need Fathers, Both Parents Matter Cymru. My talk will focus on the results of surveys carried out by the charity. But first, some preliminaries about me, about the charity, and about the big picture statistics of domestic abuse. I am a semi-retired engineer, married for 37 years with two sons in their mid-30s. The only thing that is important you should know about me is that I've never been the victim of, nor the perpetrator of, domestic abuse. Also, I have no personal experience with the family courts or with child contact disputes, nor has anyone in my extended family had their own child contact or family court problems. Lamentably, I believe this is now an unusual thing to be able to claim. I stress it because a man presenting the material I'm about to present will inevitably be assumed to have a chip on his shoulder, to have been hurt by some bitter personal experience or other. This is not the case in my case. The charity Families Need Fathers, Both Parents Matter Cymru, which we tend to call just Both Parents Matter or simply BPM, separated from the English FNF about 11 years ago and has been a separate registered charity since 2009. As the name implies, we operate in Wales, but we do get some referrals coming to us from England. The original and continuing focus of the charity is to support non-resident parents and grandparents experiencing child contact difficulties after parental separation. Recognising the known benefits to children in having two involved parents, we are a child's rights charity working under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. 92% of non-resident parents are fathers and 8% are mothers. That reflects our client base. We do also assist non-resident mothers, though the bulk of our clients are fathers. For some years, the charity conducted surveys of the experiences of fathers in Wales, appropriately called the Welsh Dad Surveys. The largest of these in 2017 had 417 responses. The purpose was to ask about the experiences of men in Wales as fathers. No questions were asked in that survey about domestic abuse. Despite that, we got 23 comments left which related directly to men's experience of domestic abuse. We didn't ask any questions about suicidality either, but we got nine comments which related directly to that too. Here are some examples from that earlier survey. All police say when you're the victim of abuse from your ex-partner and they know about it is, you're between a rock and a hard place and I would not want to be you. It was a year before they would look into the kids getting hit by mum, as they wouldn't believe me. And that was only when the school called to say the children had said mum who was hitting them. Despite the mother making death threats to me in front of a police officer, I was routinely told things like, what sort of man are you being scared of a woman? On reporting a breach of a restraining order, I was told to stop wasting their time. Of a statutory service, inherently sexist and an absolute disgrace, looking for any possibility to show mothers in a good light, even if, as in my case, mother had convictions for assault on me and my partner and a two-year restraining order. This was ignored by the service, but they did think it was important to state that her house was decorated to an extremely high standard. I rang the police and had myself arrested after I slapped my wife. 
After years of abuse and my life completely controlled, I reacted to being shouted at and told again that I could not take my daughter out on my own. I do feel they failed in recognising that I was the one being abused and couldn't take it any more. Instead, I was the abuser. It's been about six years now since seeing her, my daughter. Every night I wake up thinking about her. I cannot sleep. I have sat in my car many a time wanting to end it all. I have to go to work, but when I'm home I spend a lot of time on my own. When I'm in work, I put on a brave face. They don't know the half of it. I never stop thinking about taking my own life. There is no help available. I just want to share my daughter's lives, that's all. I don't want to be told I'm depressed, etc. I know that. My life has become totally impossible. I never did anything wrong. I've lost my entire family, who have chosen to believe my ex's lies and my children's not wishing to see me being my own fault. I'm completely alone and will almost certainly kill myself at some point which, as all the mental health specialists acknowledge, would be a perfectly rational and reasonable thing to do. It's only about when. Ignoring my concerns, even after my eldest tried to commit suicide as he couldn't see me. He was eight at the time. He tried again when he was thirteen. My second son was placed in foster care as mum couldn't cope. Why was he not put with me? The next commenter may have an answer to that. One quote from my child's social worker will always remain with me. We do not support biological fathers to take care of their children, whatever the circumstances. I hope you're not too depressed already. We've a long way yet to go. As a result of it becoming so apparent that domestic abuse played such a large part in our clients' experiences, in 2019, the charity started a specialist male domestic abuse service called IGIS. Male domestic abuse drop-in facilities in two locations in South Wales were started thanks to small grants from the National Lottery and the Neathport Talbot County Council. These are currently open for an hour per week in each of the two locations. We hope to continue and expand upon this limited provision, but as always, funding will be an issue. Also in 2019, we started a buddy scheme aimed at providing emotional support to service users undergoing these traumas, initially with some funding from the West Glamorgan Regional Health Board and Swansea Council for Voluntary Service, and now funded by the Judah Trust. Before looking at the 2018 survey of male victims, let me turn briefly to the big picture statistics of domestic abuse. Unless otherwise stated, the statistic will be from the 2017-18 CSEW, the Crime Survey for England and Wales. This slide shows why a charity primarily concerned with non-resident parents after parental separation has been led into the domestic abuse arena. Partner abuse is very strongly related to separation and divorce. A, stati a statistic you'll not hear on the media very much is that only about 5% of partner abuse relates to married couples. About 5% or 6% of survey respondents report domestic abuse in the last year. Be warned that this figure and all the familiar headline figures on domestic abuse do not distinguish between the very minor, such as a single instance of being pushed, and the truly horrible, persistent, serious abuse suffered by some. In the UK, about one in three victims of domestic abuse or partner abuse are men, according to the CSEW. Women commit 92% to 95% of partner abuse against men. 
I particularly stress those last two statistics, do remember them. Domestic abuse has been trending down for about 25 years, albeit it may have flattened out of late. However, contrary to the impression you may get from the media, it's not a wildly growing epidemic. The huge meta-analysis by the Partner Abuse State of Knowledge Project, PASC, in 2013, took data from all over the world. Its headline conclusions were not welcomed in some quarters, namely, rather more than half of partner abuse is mutual, six of one and half a dozen of the other. But where the abuse is one way, with a clear victim and a clear perpetrator, the PASC study reported that women were twice as often the perpetrators as men. Personally, I prefer not to get hung up on exact statistics. My conclusion from all I have read in the literature and the surveys is simply that domestic abuse and partner abuse is not gendered. Unfortunately, this is directly contrary to the narrative that has dominated amongst those who claim authority within the service sector, and hence also in public perception. 25% of police recorded domestic abuse is for male victims. But what about the impact of the abuse? Of those seeking medical attention because of partner abuse, 26.4% were male. 11% of men and 7.2% of women who reported partner abuse in the CSEW tried to kill themselves as a result of the abuse experienced in the last year. In sharp contrast to the evidence, what we hear repeated endlessly or simply assumed by omission of any male victims is women are the overwhelming majority of victims of domestic abuse. That a lobby group such as Women's Aid promulgate this notion is hardly surprising. Lobby groups cannot be expected to be unbiased. Bias, you might say, is their raison d'etre. But this false perspective has been adopted in all centres of influence, including amongst those who make our laws. In a debate on the new domestic abuse bill in July 2019, Victoria Atkins, Minister for Safeguarding and then Minister for Women, said in the House of Commons, Of the two million victims, we estimate that around 1.3 million are female and around 695,000 are male. And within that 695,000, we believe, and it is very difficult to identify this, and there are problems in doing so, that the majority of perpetrators are male. Climbing upon his white charger, MP John Woodcock was keen to agree. He said, an overwhelming majority of perpetrators are men. This statement is false and wildly false. About 92% to 95% of the perpetrators of partner violence against men are women. And the majority of perpetrators of all domestic abuse against males are women. Yet none of the MPs corrected these false statements being made in Parliament in the context of a debate to change the law on domestic abuse. It's no small matter. With the access that MPs and ministers have to research data and statistics, and with paid researchers and assistants to handle the digging out of data for them, they have no excuse for making such errors. It was not an error. It was deliberate. Mankind initiative can be quoted thus. It is an untruth, a deliberate falsehood designed to minimise the experiences of heterosexual male victims and also having the unintended consequences of portraying male same-sex relationships as being highly abusive. 
A minister misleading the House is usually taken to be a very serious matter, often precipitating that minister's resignation. But for that to happen, the false statement must, be ra must raise the ire of some members who then complain. This episode proves that merely denigrating men as a class with wildly false statistics is quite a safe thing to do because our parliamentarians don't care about that. This false narrative on male victims of domestic abuse is self-sustaining. It leads to disproportionately little service provision for male victims, which in turn is used to spuriously claim there is little need for such support. The male victims have vanished away as follows. From PASC, somewhat more than 50% of victims are men. From the CSEW, 33% of victims are men. 26% of those requiring medical attention are men, and 25% of reports to police are men. 17% of victims in prosecutions for domestic abuse are men but only 5% of those considered in MARAX, multi-agency risk assessment conferences, are men. And similarly, only 5% of those receiving IDVA support, independent domestic violence advisor support, are men. And just 4% of those receiving community support, such as by charities, are men. And finally, in terms of ref refuge provision, only 2% goes to men. It's about time we started referring to this phenomenon by the correct term, and that term is prejudice. The false narrative emanates from the feminist lobby. Innumerable feminist sources, such as Women's Aid, promote this perspective, such as... Domestic abuse is a violation of women and their children's human rights. It's the result of an abuse of power and control and is rooted in the historical status and inequality of women in society. Domestic abuse is a form of gender-based violence, violence directed against a woman because she is a woman. This defines away men as victims. Time does not permit a digression into the evolutionary, cultural and political factors which lead to this false picture being so much more acceptable to society than the truth. However, the male power and control theory of domestic abuse has been thoroughly discredited repeatedly not least by academic publications, by other speakers at this conference and their colleagues. However, all you need to refute it is the observation that it is consistently found in surveys which disaggregate the abuse statistics by sexuality. In all the surveys I have seen, lesbian and bisexual women come out top in terms of partner abuse incidents. On screen are the most recent CSEW statistics, which confirms this yet again. Finally, the main event, the charity's 2018 survey of male victims of domestic abuse. Unlike the charity's earlier surveys, this one was not specific to fathers, though most respondents were. Nor was it specific to Wales or even the UK. However, 93% of respondents were from the UK, so it can be taken as a UK survey to a reasonable approximation. And of course, the survey was specific to male victims of abuse. We obtained 728 responses. 95% of respondents were heterosexual. 95% identified their abuser as female, 3% as male. Victoria Atkins and Parliament in general, please note. 
about 94% of victims were no longer living with their abuser, consistent with the histogram I showed earlier. The output from the survey was of two types. The first was numerical results from questions with tick box responses. These are easy to present in terms of statistics. I shall do that first. More problematical, but also more informative in some ways, are the written text comments. The problem here is that there are 1,852 of them. I must necessarily present to you only a very small proportion of these comments, as many as time will allow without straining your patients too much. But this is a pity because part of the message here lies in the sheer volume of responses, as well as the common themes repeated over and over. So, firstly to the numerical results. The question was, have you faced any form of prejudice or stereotyping as a victim of abuse because you are a man? e.g. police telling you to man up, social workers assuming that you must be the perpetrator, DV support services asking you questions to determine whether your partner is the real victim, and so on. 70% answered yes. Only 17% answered no. Over and over again in the text comments to the survey, men state that no one believed them and everyone interpreted their claims as covering their own abusive behaviour. Question. Has a partner or ex-partner physically assaulted you in any of the following ways? Any form of physical abuse? 74%. Slapped, kicked, scratched? 55%. Pushed, shoved? 55%. Threw things? 49%. Prevented me leaving the room, 34%. Used or threatened to use a weapon, e.g. a knife, 33%. Recall these are percentages of people who, men that is, or men and boys, that responded to a survey specifically about domestic abuse. So it's not prevalent in the general population. Question. Has a partner or ex-partner behaved in any of the following non-physical ways towards you? Any form of non-physical abuse, essentially all of them. Used child contact denial as a threat or form of abuse, 89%. Made or threatened to make false allegations, 81%. Socially isolated me from friends and relations, read texts, etc. 64%. Overly criticised me in public, put me down. 72%. Gaslighting, 62%. Controlled my access to money or ran up debts without my consent. 55%. Stalked or harassed me. 32%. And this last one, take particular note made me feel sexually inadequate or forced me to engage in sexual acts, 31%. Note that last one. Unfortunately, we did not disaggregate being forced to engage in sexual acts from being made to feel sexually inadequate. But note that forcing someone to engage in sexual acts without their consent is an offence which carries a maximum sentence of 10 years in prison, even if penetration is not involved, and hence, in principle, even if the victim is a man and the perpetrator is a woman. But what reception do you think a man would get reporting that to the police? Question. Was the support you received helpful to reducing or preventing the abuse you suffered? This was measured on a scale from 1 to 5, where 5 means very helpful and supportive, but where 1 means very unhelpful, they treated me as the abuser or reported me to others, 
and two means not helpful. They seemed not to believe or to care about my experience. And three means neither good nor bad. They didn't do much. I've collected the responses under either scores one or two or scores one, two or three. You can see on screen now that social services and the police score woefully badly with 93% of the social service experience with the social services scoring one, two or three and 87% with the police. Even victim support, 77%, and DV charities, 64%. But which services got a good crit? Between them, FNF, FNF BPM Cymru and FNF Scotland, as it was, got 28 mentions, all very positive. Similarly, Mankind Initiative got seven mentions, all positive. They're the two categories that got a good crit. Question, if you didn't seek help as a victim, what prevented you from doing so? I didn't realize that what I was experiencing was abuse. Just over half of men said that. I didn't know where to turn for help, 52%. I didn't think I would be, be, be believed, 51%. And to, let's be fair, those men were correct in thinking that. They would not be believed in general. I was afraid of the consequences of seeking help if my abuser found out, e.g. child contact denial or counter-allegations, 46%. Again, a perfectly realistic concern borne out by men's experience. Question, what sort of help would have made things better for you? Support to recover from the psychological trauma came top, 58%. This, of course, was part of the motivation for starting the buddy scheme. Help to keep my children safe came second at 54%. Then we had practical help with legal protection from the perpetrator, just under half. Peer mentoring and support, talking in groups of people with similar experiences, 47%, again motivating the buddy scheme. Advocacy support, helping engaging with services, 40%, and so on. Question. How important is it that services for male victims should be grounded in the experience of men and separated from services primarily designed for women? 82% said important or essential. Most said essential. Next, I will give you a selection of the 1,852 comments left on the survey. First, some that may surprise some people. Sexual assault of the most serious kind, please add this as a category. The gender of the abuser was not mentioned on this one, but the following ones did. I was directly, forcibly, physically, sexually abused on multiple occasions, meeting the legal definition of serious sexual assault, and what if not for the inequality of the rape law, which requires the abuser to have a penis, would be classed as rape. I was raped. I was also run over and countless other instances of physical abuse. Controlling both financially and sexually. Forced me to have sex while children were in the room. Strip searched me whenever I came home. Was sexually harassed and told the only reason I didn't like it was because she was ugly. Constantly told I was useless, lazy, accused of being or wanting to be unfaithful, 
She used to smell my genitals when I came in from work. Would threaten to cut herself if she didn't get what she wanted. Ran up £65,000 worth of debts. I ended up working 80 plus hours a week and was physically and mentally exhausted, but still had to perform on demand. Used to say that she would say I had touched the kids or had kiddie porn. I ended up in prison. I have an involuntary flinch now because of her pulling her arm back as if to punch half the time she did. She would phone me up up to ten times a day to check up on me. And if I couldn't answer, there was hell to pay when I got home. When I ended the relationship, she moved in with a new bloke within a month and stopped me seeing the kids. A great deal of it revolved around throwing hot, heavy, smashable objects at me and being prevented from leaving the room, even to use the toilet or find food or drink. Picking was a common form of punishment for crying. And being physically shoved out of the house and locked outside until I was sufficiently punished or provided the correctly worded apology for an offence which was never explained to me. Punched, kicked, spat on, hit with object, bitten, she would flip and hurt any way she could. Could often tell when she was going, when she was winding herself up so she could launch. Sometimes it came out of nowhere. I could be asleep and be woken up by being punched. I always covered up my bruises so my family and friends didn't see. I felt so scared I had to lock myself away from her on a daily basis. Told me she could stab me and get away with it. A family judge laughed when I said I felt I was in danger. I wasn't allowed to see family or friends for over three years wasn't allowed to talk to anyone anywhere. A simple good morning to a stranger would result in her making my life hell. I couldn't go to see my mother on her dying bed in hospital. I wasn't allowed to go to any of the local shops. I was not allowed to talk to my neighbours. Where do I even start? Tormented me and turned everyone in my life against me, alienated me from our daughter, lied about being pregnant, then manipulated me into sleeping with her, which got her pregnant three months later, made me feel worthless, broke me. She knew my weaknesses and exploited them to control me. Then I committed suicide. There was an ongoing feeling of walking on eggshells so as not to set her off. She even shouted at our young son on one occasion, Stop walking about the house as if you're frightened of me. She made completely false allegations about me to the police about an arson attack. I have since found she'd made allegations about her first husband poisoning his children. She has accused her latest partner of rape. I was repeatedly told that I was the abuser and I was manipulative, until in the end I had no idea what was true anymore. At the points when I did argue back, she would talk and shout over me or tell me, should I make any logical headway into a given point, that I was a manipulative Pied Piper. She would say things like, you've lost your friends because of your ways. It was as if she would constantly be picking out and highlighting any and every small flaw in my character. She would paint the same perspective to anyone who would listen, primarily her colleagues at work who barely knew me personally, so she could create what she called 
Team Jill. According to her, I was the reason she had not fulfilled any of her life goals. I had held her back and forced her to have children, etc. Since I was the primary carer for our two children whilst she worked full time, Jill had control of the finances. I ran the household on £400 per month, spending nothing on myself or frivolities, whilst Jill, unbeknownst to me, ran up £15,000 worth of debts on clothes, magazines and nights out for herself. She told me this was her house because you can't afford it. I actually have a text message from her saying, I want to strip you of every bit of confidence and belief of who you think you are. I could go on. The support service directly said I was the abuser. They had to notify current and previous partners, even though I was there as a victim. Why do you make me hit you? was a line I heard as I left the room holding my cheek. I believed too sometimes that it was my own fault. One of the officers advised me informally to be really careful because he thought she would try and try to provoke me into a reaction and then she would have me locked up. Subsequently, I just stood and took it, remembering what the policeman had said. My self-esteem was so low, I lacked the motivation to seek help. Psychologically, I was beat. I had accepted that it was my behaviour that somehow managed to piss my wife off, to the extent that she exploded. Police sometimes sniggered and seemed to be going through the motions while laughing to each other. Female police officer looked at me and shrugged her shoulders when I told her how frightened I was. I was told to man up on a number of occasions, on all occasions, by women. The interviewing officer, a woman, as were all the officers that were sent to deal with my many calls for help, told me I should grow a pair. This was just one instance of the abuse that I received from police officers, all female, every time I called them for help, even after I had been granted an occupation order. What did you do to cause it? My father would tell me I was a loser for leaving the mother of my child, told me I wasn't a man, what harm can a woman do, he'd say. DV agencies almost universally treated me like the abuser or the definite abuser. I avoid telling people as the few outside my closest circle whom I have told treat me as though it's my own fault and I should never have allowed the situation to get so bad. Social services even refused to watch a video of our daughter being violently assaulted. Social services never believed, even suggested to a judge, we shared the house, even though I was a high-risk victim with a marak. Kafkas told me if I wanted contact with my children, I would have to accept the situation. When I first went to seek help from the police, the female desk officer made an immediate assumption I was a perpetrator of domestic abuse, repeatedly told me the overwhelming majority of perpetrators of domestic abuse are male. I eventually gave up and left. The police tried to scare me off by saying if I made a report I risked my children being taken into care. It was clear the police expected the man to leave the home, even though I was the main carer. 
I told the police of the ongoing abuse and I was told to leave my house in the middle of winter, slept in the park and the police chased me on in the middle of the night. After being assaulted with a marked face, being told, go near her again and you're nicked, told to fuck off after trying to report being locked in the house. Doctor said, be a man, didn't recognise abuse, told him to refer me to the local family crisis service, said only for women. I told him the poster in his waiting room was about men being abused. Was told, you must pay up for sleeping with her. The DVIP treated me appallingly. I was under suspicion from the start. They appeared unable to accept that a woman was a perpetrator and ignored her criminal conviction for domestic violence and said I had responsibility for her violence towards me. Nurse acting, how big is your wife for you to say she did this to you? Police stated clearly that we don't believe a woman would assault a man. Social worker allocated refused to meet me, said it wasn't necessary. I ended up having to do a domestic violence course where the facilitator said, you men are all the same. I am a big man and everyone felt I could cope, but was breaking up inside. Many women think that men don't feel. I'll just add my own comment to that one in passing. I'll just say this. Theory of normative male alexithemia. And then consider a raspberry bone blown. As a man, I know others that put up with abuse from their wives and are ashamed. There is no help for men, and it is a very lonely place. As a rule, we are simply not believed. Recall that the survey is of male victims, not necessarily adult men. Here's a few from male children or men recalling when they were children. As a child, I was repeatedly severely beaten by my mother. My brother suffered the same abuse. My brother and I ran away from home when our social worker was visiting. During her visit, we had been sent to do the washing up. As kids do, we were fooling around and laughing. My mother stormed in and quietly but aggressively told us to shut up and slapped me a few times. When my brother laughed, she grabbed the broom and hit him so hard it snapped over his back. The social worker was oblivious or just didn't care. We went to my grand's house who phoned the emergency social services. When they interviewed us, they came to the conclusion we were making up our stories for fear of being disciplined for running away. We were swiftly returned home. My brother finally found the courage to tell school staff what had been going on and was taken into care. When I returned from school, my mother ambushed me and told me what had happened. She told me to tell the social services and police that she was a loving mother and had never treated us badly. Soon after, police and social workers turned up and interviewed me in front of her. She glared at me the entire time, and I lied to protect her. A month or so later, my brother came back home. He felt guilty about leaving me there alone with my mother. The abuse continued. I've had the typical man-up response from most people I've told. Many others believe the story to be far too severe to be true but I've only ever touched on the overall picture, despite the details being far more harrowing. I know within myself that what I endured was literally torture. Many see it as just a mother giving her kids a spanking. This couldn't be further from the truth, 
and forces me to keep quiet about the subject in general. And here are a few touching on suicidality. It's a killer. Suicide was an option I considered once. I now do not see my children. It's brought me to think several times about ending my life to stop the pain. For 13 years I was with them every day, until now. I have been victim to some utterly repugnant abuse during the past seven years, and I have found it so difficult to be heard or believed that I have come face to face with the potential relief of suicide on innumerable occasions. There is a complete failure of the system to adequately deal with men who have been abused, and the services designed to help women are tipping on the fulcrum of demonising men in order to get funding. This is repulsive. I'm seeing it everywhere now. Friends and colleagues describe their relationships and I can't believe I've got a support network made up of people who live with being controlled and abused every day. It's very sad. We need much more awareness in the UK. I feel like the veil has been removed from in front of my eyes. How can MPs legally vote on a bill, the Istanbul Convention, that only helps women and girls? Yes, that was a genuine comment, not my comment. And the answer, of course, which is my comment, is institutionalised prejudice. I've just read you 58 of the written comments in the survey. Recall there were actually 1,852 comments. I've read them all. Imagine what it's like to have recently read all those comments and then to hear the bishop of somewhere or other on Radio 4's Thought for the Day giving us all a lecture on men's wickedness in domestically abusing their female partners. As usual, giving listeners entirely the wrong, that is, unbalanced impression. The same wrong impression which holds a monopoly within Parliament and hence determines our laws on domestic abuse. I say again, this is prejudice, entirely disconnected from empirical reality. It is not noble or brave, or by some insane logic, social justice, to be party to such prejudice, nor is it in the slightest bit progressive. It's actually yielding to ancient inclinations, which result in part from evolution and in part from long-established cultural norms. The radical thing would be to acknowledge the truth and bestow compassion where it is deserved. <laughs>